Grab some pencils, yep. If you have a if you don't have a paper, don't need the pen, right? Okay, you guys can share pens here. You ran out? Grab some pen. Maybe you just hand out some pens here. If you have sheets, looks like you ladies need some pens. Pens. There you go. It better they better be all right then, inshallah. Okay. Oh, after. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. You guys don't have any quizzes? You don't? We have more in the front. Yeah. So, uh, pens. Do people need pens? You guys need pens? I'm gonna, we'll give you some papers here. Pens. Here, I'll let you keep this and just pass it around. That'd be great. Thank you. Isa, yeah, that one, not the round one. Yeah. Okay, inshallah, I think uh, uh, I don't see Maher here. I'm wondering if we can begin. You can work together, of course. You, okay, so this is what I want. Is What I want is everyone to take a look at the sheet of paper. This is kind of while we're waiting, we're killing time here with this sheet of paper. Before you talk to your friends, I want you to look at that paper and ask yourself, can I put these in order from 1 to 23? Okay? And don't, don't tell me if you can or you can't. I see some heads shaking already like, oh, man, this is tough. I can't do it. Like, I see that already, which is great. You're right where I want you. I want you to not be able to know any of this stuff. Okay, and, um, and then once you have a feeling or a realization, then turn to your friend, see if you can fill it out. I'm going to give you two minutes to fill it out, and then we'll begin the, the, uh, the talk, inshallah. Does that sound good? Two minutes is enough, right? Any feedback? Yes? Okay. Ready? Get set. Go. Five, four, three, two, one. Uh, okay, fantastic. Okay, who nailed it? Come on. Amr. Come on. Musa. Inshallah. Okay, so let me introduce myself to you. My name is Miraj Mohideen. I am incredibly happy to be here today. I just moved here uh, about six months ago from Phoenix, Arizona. And I uh, moved here with my 
two sons. This is the eldest, Isa, and my little one, Ismail, who actually goes to Pillars Academy. He's in the pre-K pro program there. And my wife, Hafsa, who I hope, inshallah, she's not here tonight because she's with the little one, but inshallah, next time she'll be here so that she can meet some of you. We moved here, um, number one, because we wanted a better Muslim community for my kids. And so I live very close to the masjid here. This is the main masjid, inshallah, I hope to be a part of. And so I can't tell you how important it is to me to, to be here with you tonight and start meeting faces. I've tried to meet some of you, alhamdulillah, very friendly faces, but I'm hoping that I can know all of you, inshallah, and vice versa, and this can be part of our new family. So my family made a hijrah to come out here, to be here. And we're going to be talking about hijrah a lot today. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about my story of how I wrote um, my book, Revelation. Maybe you can take out a... Uh, Where's that box? He's over there. You can take out one, one copy over that. Um, <clears throat> but before we get into that, we have four objectives today, inshallah. If we can hit two of the four, I'll be happy. Three of the four will be fantastic. Four of the four, it'll be really good. The first objective is very easy. We're going to do a cooking class today. Okay. Oh. So this is my book, Revelation. I don't know if some of you have seen this before. It's a seerah of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And I'll tell you a little bit more about it um, as we move forward here. You can give that back to her, and then I'll just grab a new one from there. <clears throat> so I like to keep things very simple. One of the reasons why I wrote Revelation is because I was getting very confused, and I felt disconnected from my deen. And I was a Muslim who was pretty connected to the deen, meaning like I grew up in a very purposeful family and so forth. But even then, I felt like, you know what, for some reason the Quran doesn't make me cry, it doesn't really move me. I get more confused reading the Qur'an than I get moved by it. And something's missing in my approach to the Qur'an. And that's what kick-started Revelation. So my approach when I teach Sira, and I've taught many places around the country and even other parts of the world, is I'm realizing that people just jump into these details so fast. And there are very few people who actually understand the point of the seerah. And when I say seerah, I mean the life of the Prophet Muhammad, the way of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Okay? And I very much like to approach things from just like a, like, you know, like when people, when the electrician comes to my house and he's explaining something to me, like I always say, just explain this to me like I'm a three-year-old. Like, I like it very simple. Just give me the basic, like, what is the point? What's the problem? The router's not working. And, you know, he's like, well, the DNS pin number. I'm like, I don't get all that. Just explain to me, like, there's a radio wave, like, Explain simply to me. And I think one of the problems with Sira, which is critically important, is that it gets people throw details at people and they miss the whole point of what is the point of all of this. There's reverb here somewhere. So we're going to start with a cooking class today because cooking is very simple and easy, a baking class. Okay. Now, Isa right here is going to point out four items on this table right here. Okay. Do you guys see all of these? Isa, can you... Tell, tell everyone what that is. And what is this? A mixing bowl with a whisk, a plate, and... A baking pan. Yeah. Does everyone see that? Plate, baking pan, toaster. That's all I'm going to say about this. Okay, now Issa, you want you to have a seat over here for a second. I want my first brave volunteer. Yes, yes, We just met today, inshallah. These are four items. I'm not giving them any instructions whatsoever, other than Yazan, can you put these four items in an order that makes sense to you? I've just thrown out four details to you. Can you put this in an order that makes sense? Okay, so he put the serving plate, this is a serving plate I should say, whisk, mixing bowl, cookie tray, oven. Okay, how many of you guys agree? I didn't tell him what to do, I just said put it in an order that makes sense. How many of you like that order? How many of you want to give him some suggestions to modify the order? Raise your hand if you like the order. Okay, you got help here. Okay, raise your hand if you want to modify the order. Okay. 
since you raised your hand first in the back, tell me the order that you would like to. Uh, give, give him a hand and tell, and now give him a hand to help him and tell him what order would you like to put this in? So that's your hint. Mm. Of course. Wait, can you say that again? Oh, of course. You gotta make it first though. Then you have to okay, well she she had a good question. I like the way you I like I like the way you did it. I really like the way you did it. And do you appreciate how she did that? Okay, so can you say it again? Uh, the worst is nice, but what am I gonna eat the cookies off of if the plate is first? Oh that's cool. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. Is that good? Okay. Okay, let's move this. Let's fix the tablecloth. Okay, perfect. Okay. So now, what do we have? Mixing bowl. Cookie plate. Cookie plate goes where? Put it open up the oven. Oven, close it. Bake the cookies. Serve them. Who wants delicious cookies? Okay. Did he nail it? Okay. Mashallah. Okay. Good. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So remember I said item point number one. Okay. Have a seat here. Point number one. If we were to draw out this recipe right here. into four steps, right? Let's call this step one, step two, step three, and step four. So it's like goes like this. Does that make sense to you? Does that make sense? Step one we said was what, guys? The mixing bowl. Step two we said was? The cooking plate, the, the tray. Step three was the toaster oven, right? I'm just gonna put heat here. And step four was with this amazing cookie on it. What are we focusing on right now? What is this about, this example? Oh, uh, yes, who said that? Process, okay? All that I'm trying to point out to you is that a recipe requires a process. You can have all the parts you want, but if the process is not in the right order, say for example, instead of taking an egg, cracking it on the side and throwing it in here, I open this up, I take a hard egg without shelling it, and I just throw it in there on high heat. What happens? Yeah, the fire alarm's gonna go off, the fire department will come, it's smoking, right? Oh, oh, oh wait, 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 we made a mistake. Oh, oh, before it gets to fires, let's throw some flour and some butter on it to put out the fire. I mean, we're using all the ingredients, right? I mean, it's all there. And then we take it out and we have this charred tray and then I have this like piece of charcoal here, and I say, have a cookie. Who wants a cookie? Brother, please, have a cookie. Who, who would like one of my delicious cookies? L look at this tray. And I really want you to look closely at this tray. Would you like to eat a cookie off of it? That's oh, really good. I used all the right ingredients. And I want you to take a close look at the tray, like really close look at it. That's why I'm walking all the way back here. So you look at this tray. Who wants a cookie off of this tray? We used all the ingredients. Why is this not turning out? The reason why is because we did not use the appropriate, what's the word guys? Process. So in this talk, we've covered point number one. You have to do things with the right process. Just because you have the right ingredients means nothing it actually can turn into a disaster. In fact, I bet people who, say this is my kitchen, 
Okay, say I'm one of the people out there who's got like a cookie stand. I bet it's better not to serve any cookies than to advertise that you're selling cookies and then you serve pieces of charcoal on an oily tray. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because now I've turned people off from cookies. Like people are like, dude, I don't, want, I don't want to eat cookies right now. It's disgusting. Yes? Better not to serve cookies at all than to try to serve cookies, use all the correct ingredients, but totally mess up the process. You guys see where we're going with this? The sira is not a list of ingredients like you have right here. But this is how the sira occurs to most of us. Okay, I want to speak very candidly with you. I've spoken so many places around the country. 99% of Muslims don't know anything about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and even more know about the Quran. Like, we are very out of touch with the life of the Prophet, peace upon him. We're even more out of touch with the Quran. Because the Prophet, I always say, is the easiest science to study. Forget about the Jweed and all this other. That's, like, hard. The Prophet, it's, not, it's like watching a movie. It's, like, enjoyable, it's beautiful, human connection, all that kind of stuff. And yet, we're so out of touch with this. When I was writing my book, so many Christians, I would go to a coffee shop. Christians would be pouring over the Bible, and it's, like, highlighted. And I would be like, man, Muslims don't read like this. And what, you, what they know about Isa al -Islam, you couldn't even fit on a paragraph of a page. You couldn't fill half a page about what they actually know about Isa al -Islam. And you can, I could tell you what the Prophet Islam was doing on a Friday afternoon when he was 61 years old. Like that's how much detail. But we don't, for some reason, we have this strange relationship with the Prophet, peace upon him, which we can talk about maybe in a Q&A or in a later session. But I believe we have a culture around loving the Prophet that absolves us of, from the reality of me actually getting to know the Prophet. Like, let's just sing about him and celebrate his life. And it kind of takes the responsibility off of actually getting to know the individual, if that makes sense. When we talk about the process, the sira, the prophet, peace upon him, was a chef. And he was baking, what? Cookies. He said cookies. The prophet, peace upon him, was baking cookies. What were the names of some of the cookies, the flavors of cookies he was making? Isa. Chocolate. I don't know if they had chocolate back then in Arabia. Did they have chocolate? Can you tell me the name of a cookie? Huh? Cookies that the Prophet ﷺ was baking. Abu Bakr Siddiq, radiallahu anh. Tell me the name of another cookie he baked. Sayyidina Uthman. Tell me another name. Omar Abdul. Tell me the best cookie. The sweetest of all, the best cookie, his favorite cookie that he baked. No, 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 no. This is per opinion. This is my personal opinion. So don't, YouTube, uh, this is on YouTube now. Uh, now, I think there's one cookie that was better than all the other cookies. That was Sayyidina Khadija radiallahu anha. He was, she was the best cookie. She was the most beloved to him of everybody. I mean, you can, we can argue that point, but uh, as far as I'm concerned, she was the prophet's best friend, deepest companion, to the point that other wives are so jealous of Sayyidina Khadija, and he would get mad at them when they even expressed, even like a look, you have no idea who she was and what she did for me, right? So the Prophet, peace upon him, was sent to a place where they had all of these ingredients. They had pagan ideas, but they also had a lot of Abrahamic ideals. I mean, the Kaaba itself was built by Ibrahim al-Islam. They were doing tawaf before the Prophet came, right? So they had the idea, we gotta go around and do tawaf, they just forgot the detail that you're not supposed to do it naked. Did you know that you should do the off naked? It's in the Quran, right? So they had the details. They're just doing it all out of order, and they're messing it up. So Allah sends a chef to the, the, the Meccans. He said, look, we have this beautiful deen. All these chefs came before. Adam al -Islam, Nuh, Ibrahim al -Islam, Ismail, Ishaq, right? Musa. Zakaria, Yahya, Isa al -Islam. they were chefs, they're telling you, guys, you're, you're, doing, you're throwing the eggs in the oven, things are burning, it's smelling horrible, no one wants to eat the cookies, no one, wants to, no one smells the beauty of what Allah is giving you. So the, Allah sent the Prophet, peace upon him, to re-give the recipe. What's the recipe book that we have? Islam, but what's the book? The Qur'an. 
That's a recipe book. Allah says, I've sent it as a mercy to you and a guide. Like that's a recipe. It's a guide because it tells you how to do it. And it's a mercy because you smell really good when you actually let it work on you. So you're the cookie. So we get the cookie, we get the recipe, and now we're sitting here with this recipe. But a lot of us, unfortunately, the Muslim Ummah, no one wants to eat these cookies. We're the cookies, no one wants a piece of that. Why? Because we don't smell that good. It's a lot of us, not us here, inshallah, but like around the world, this has been, the process has been messed up. Does that make sense? Any questions so far? I'm going to take a water break real quick. Anyone have any questions up to this point? Because I'm moving fast, because we have a lot to cover. Questions? Uh, is it making sense? Yeah? Okay. I hope I'm not coming off as stern. It's just that I'm like, I want to push through fast, so, and I'm very passionate about this stuff. Okay. While I'm erasing, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. So, like I said, I, um, I'm a physician, and in 2002, I finished medical school, and I was studying for my licensing exams. And when I was studying for my licensing exams, I realized that, wow, I have never known this much information about anything in my life, like I know about immunology and histology and cardiac physiology and all these ologies. Like, I've never known this much information. And I remember sitting there studying for my exam. I'm sure like some of you guys are studying for your test. You're like, I can't, I can't believe I've ever known this much. I'll probably forget it tomorrow, but I can't believe I have all this information in my head today. And I was sitting in a library and I was like, you know what's crazy is I know all these stacks of books. But like the one book that I say that is like the most important book in my life, which is the Quran. Like, I don't know it. Like I had this moment of like total honesty. I was like, I don't know it. And like, I, I was a practicing Muslim. I was very involved in MSA. I was like a leader in my MSA. It's not like I was just like shying away from it. I was a proud Muslim. And as a proud Muslim, I didn't know the Quran. You know, I had memorized surahs. I had read the Quran multiple times in Arabic, but that doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean that you know anything just because you read the Quran in Arabic. I didn't know like the name. You could name a surah, and I wouldn't even know if that was the name of a surah in the Quran. And I guarantee you, most of you here today, if I start naming surahs, uh, like, and I say, Raise your hand if this is the name of a surah. And I start naming things, it'll get very awkward in here really fast, right? Because most people don't read the Quran. So I said to myself, okay, as soon as I'm done with this last exam, I'm going to just dedicate myself to, memori to not memorizing, to knowing the Quran the way I know, like, human physiology. Like, it should not be more complicated than, this stuff is like some of the most complicated stuff. It's not like Allah is like a, a mean professor who doesn't want me to pass. He wants me to connect with the material. For some reason, I just haven't been able to. I'm going to start studying the Quran. So I started reading the Quran, Al-Fatiha, easy, right? So simple, inshallah, we all know it, and we know the translation of it, we know the meaning of it. Perfect, I was, felt great, I had like a little journal, I'm taking notes, highlighting, like all like typical like goody student, right? Surah Baqarah, next surah, bam! <laughs> surah Baqarah, longest surah in the Quran, one of the hardest surahs in the Quran to get through. How many of you know what I'm talking about when you read Surah Baqarah? Raise your hand. It's a hard surah. Why is it a hard surah? Surah Baqarah, this is a book, there's no doubt. Okay, I guess so. I mean, like, I can't say that, like, I want to say there's no doubt, but, like, I don't feel that because I didn't have any experience with it. Then Allah starts talking about who? Immediately, Adam al -Islam. Oh, good, we're talking about Adam al that makes sense. We're in the beginning, like, in Genesis. Let's just start from the beginning, talk about Adam al right? Iblis, the story. Then all of a sudden, who? Who does it talk about? Yeah, Bani Israel. Not even Musa, Bani Israel is the subject. All of a sudden, Allah is like, mm, giving it to Bani Israel. They did this, and they didn't do this, and they did this, and they did this. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, I was like, okay with Fatiha, but like, this is getting very heavy very fast. Do you understand what I'm saying? And then you go a little bit further in Surah Baqarah, right? And then we're, what are we talking about now? What are some of the things that come up in Surah Baqarah? Huh? Inheritance laws? Charity. What else starts coming up? Women's rights, Hajj, all of these heavy civil law, criminal law, inheritance law. Like I'm, I'm not a law student. I'm just like trying to learn. I'm just trying to learn Fatiha right here. Fine, but I made it through Al Baqarah somehow, taking notes. I'm like, I think I'm kind of getting it. I don't have the context. And for those of you who know you who read the Quran. Allah can be talking about one thing, and then next second, it's like, well, we're over here now talking about this, right? 
And then we're going to go back and touch on this, and then we're going to go talk about this other thing that happened, but you don't know about what happened, but just keep reading. That's my experience with the Quran. Who can relate to that? Okay. But you make it through Al-Baqarah. Woohoo. Next surah is going to be so much easier. What's the next surah? Ali Imran. Heavy. So, Fatiha, I'm happy. Baqarah, oh, I made it. Right? Surah Ali Imran is like, right? Like, by the time you get to Surah An-Nisa, you're just like passing out now. Surah An-Nisa is a very heavy surah. Why are these surahs so heavy? Why is Allah such a difficult professor? Allah that he's a difficult professor. He just wants us to fail. So what's going on here? So that's what led me to stop reading the Quran. I said, I'm done. Either I'm not smart or like it wasn't meant for me. Allah says he's going to guide who he will guide. But what's going on? And so then I sat to myself. And I was very frustrated, very frustrated. And I said, what am I trying to achieve here? Let's like step back and be like, what is my purpose? Like, why am I trying to connect with the Quran? Am I trying to connect with it because I want to be moved by it? Am I trying to just feel good about myself that I'm not like a bad Muslim? Like, what am I trying to achieve? And then I finally realized after days, maybe weeks of just honest, thoughtful reflection, I just want to be like my role model. And for me personally, my role model, I tell people this, of course, we say the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, but in a way, he's not my role model. My personal role model is Sayyidina Abu Bakr. Because he best emulated the Prophet without being a Prophet. Does that make sense? Like, I can actually be like that guy. I can't, I don't get, I'm not going to get revelation, but I can be like a guy who is the Prophet's best friend. Now, there's a description of Sayyidina Abu Bakr that says that at the, at, the, uh, at the end of the Prophet's life, peace be upon him, he couldn't, he was too weak to lead the Salah. And so he told his wife, I can't lead. Tell your dad to lead the Salah. Right? Which wife was he talking to? Sayyidina Aisha, right? Tell your father to lead the Salah. I can't lead it. And what was Sayyidina Aisha's reaction? Yes. Daddy. What was her reaction? Who knows Sayyidina Aisha's reaction? Huh? She said, no, he can't. My father can't lead the Salah. Rasulullah. He can't lead. Like, how can she say no to the Prophet? Peace be upon him. He can't lead the Salah. Ask Omar. Of course, Omar, like, big voice, tall, beaming, everyone's going to get lined behind Omar. Ask Omar, he can lead the Salah. And the Prophet's like, no, ask, he said, ask your father. He said, no, he can't lead because he cries too much when he reads the Quran. He literally will not be able to get through the, the Salah because he is so connected to the Quran, he just cries, he breaks down every time. Like, it's like logistically not going to work out. That's basically what she's saying. That's how connected this human being is to the Quran. And the Prophet says, no, get your father Abu Bakr and he's going to lead the prayer. Why? What's so special about Sayyidina Abu Bakr? He had a connection to the Quran. But let me tell you something about Sayyidina Abu Bakr. Okay. Imagine if Isa was Sayyidina Abu Bakr. And the rest of you are all the companions. And we're in Medina. And the Prophet said, this man, he's worth more in weight than all of you combined. About Sayyidina Abu Bakr. Okay. Sayyidina Abu Bakr was the only person, people would go visit the Prophet constantly. Knock, knock, Ya Rasulullah, yeah, I have a question, Ya Rasulullah. I have a question. So much so that even in the Quran it says, and I give the Prophet peace upon him a little space. He's a family man. Give him some space. Everyone wanted to bang down his door to spend time with him. Sayyidina Abu Bakr didn't go and knock on the Prophet's door. Why didn't he ever go and knock on the Prophet's door? The Prophet would go and knock on Sayyidina Abu Bakr's door. Like, can you imagine that for a second? Your companion. Of all the multitudes of companions, there were like 30,000 companions by the end. In all of that, everyone was dying for his attention. And yet Rasulullah would go, get up, walk across the way. It's not like he lived right next to him. And he'd go, yeah, Abu Bakr, can I come in? Do, do, do you feel 
who this human, this human being is? Sayyidina, what the Prophet said about Abu Bakr, and this is very powerful. He said, you know, when I brought revelation, all of you, all of you, and when he's saying all, he's including all. I mean, if you take him for his word, all of you had a little bit of, when I brought Islam, you all had like a moment. Like, let me think about what you're saying real quick before I make a decision on whether I'm going to believe in this. The only person who never hesitated was this man. Everyone had like an ounce or more, like Sayyidina Omar, who had a lot more than an ounce of hesitation, except for Abu Bakr. So why is Abu Bakr so different than everyone else? Like, and this is what I was thinking about. I want to be the guy who cries. That's what I want. I want to be moved by this man who cries all the time. And it's not fake. It's like he's, he's just moved. The other companions aren't crying, but he knows the secrets of this Quran that he can't even recite it pro properly. And I'm thinking to myself, what is it about Abu Bakr that makes him different than these other companions? The only thing that occurred to me is that he was what? The prophets? His best friend. The only qualification that he had is that he was his best friend. They were friends as kids, and they grew up together the entire time. Does that make sense? So then I realized, wait a second. If I want to cry when I hear the Quran, maybe I just become... What? Say it out loud, loudly. Rasulullah's best friend. I have to become his best friend to become the person who cries with the Quran. Is that logic making sense? Because everything else is not working. I'm failing miserably. How do I become the Prophet, peace be upon his best friend? How do you love somebody? Say it loudly. Learn more about them. I love my father. I also love my father's father, my grandfather. But I'll tell you something. I want to say this so that you can understand my point about love. Love is the most powerful emotion. It's the most powerful motivator. That's how Allah describes himself as one who loves. So, yeah, you can understand things. But if you don't love, you're not going to be special. You're not going to be great. All the greatness of the seerah, all of the companions was out of love of the Prophet and, and, and Allah. It wasn't out of like calculating out, oh, I do get 10 hasanat for this. Like, I personally don't like those conversations. Oh, you, brother, if you pray here, you get 100 hasanat. But if you multiply it on this night, you get 27,000. Just do it out of love. Like when, you, when your parents make you, ask you to make chai, you're not like, well, are you going to buy me? This? That's not, that's transactional love. Let's like really start loving, right? So the prophet, peace be upon, so Sayyidina Abu Bakr, oh, let me go back to my dad. I love my dad. I love my dad's dad too, my grandfather. But when I was thinking about it, my love for my father is very different than my love for my grandfather. Why? Man, he heard my talks, I think. He's, I didn't know my grandfather that well. If you ask me why I love my dad, I love my dad because I know what he sacrificed for me. I know him took, he took me to soccer practice. He did me here. He helped me pay for college. He did all these things. I also know what my dad struggled with. I know what his challenges were in life. And I know what he overcame and also what he failed at. And there's something about that nearness and that proximity that makes me really love him and appreciate him a lot. My grandfather I love, I couldn't, if you told me to say five things about my grandfather in like actual details, I could probably tell you five. I could tell you 500 about my father. My grandfather, I realized I love because my father loves him. Yeah, that's most of us here, right? Are the elders. We love him because he's beloved to my father, so I love him. So my love for my grandfather is actually a love based out of a culture of loving him. Does that make sense? There's a culture around loving my grandfather, and I want to be part of that culture too. My dad does. Why would I not love? He loves him. I remember when my father cried when my grandfather passed away. I felt sad because my dad was sad. I must love this man. Does that make sense? That's what I call a love by proxy. Proxy means by like in substitution. I don't love the actual thing. I love the things that love the thing. My contention, my argument is that most Muslims are in that category with the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. 
We love the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him because the Imam gives beautiful lectures about the Prophet Muhammad. Umar Suleiman makes you cry when you listen about the Prophet Muhammad. All these things are amazing. Oh, he must be great. We all got to love him because we're Muslims and it feels good to love. Why not? But if you want true love with the Prophet Muhammad, you actually got to know him. And you got to know him better than your father because the companions said he was more beloved to us than our own fathers. How could they say that unless they, didn't, they knew the Prophet better than they knew their own fathers? They asked the Prophet intimate questions about every part of his life that they would never dare ask their fathers. And the Prophet shared it because he was a guide to them. So what we're trying to do today is get ourselves to a place where we can know the Prophet. Yes? So point number two, love. I don't care what anyone else tells you. I feel very confidently that love is the most powerful force. That's why Allah talks about it so much. That's why the companions, oh, that's a one. See, that's why I have my assistant with me to help me. That's a two. Thank you, Isa. Okay. Love is the most powerful thing. If you're, if you're, if you're Islam, if your deen is not based on love, it's not really what the Prophet was teaching. I feel very confident saying that. Okay. Unfortunately, a lot of people's Islam is not based on love. It's based on knowing the details and pointing out how other people don't know what you know. Right? And Allah talks about this at length in the Quran because who did that? Who did that? No, who, who focused on the details? Bani Israel. Right? So they are an example of what not to do in the kitchen. We have an example of what to do, how to bake in the kitchen. Let's talk about the, pro, the seerah of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Let's take a, okay, questions. I got to kind of dial it back. I get very passionate. I apologize for that. I hope I'm not yelling at you guys. It's like. I told Isa today, like, if you're not smiling, talking about the Prophet, peace upon him, you're not doing it right. Right? He smiled more than anyone else. The companion said no one ever smiled more than the Prophet Islam. He was happy. He was chill. He was easygoing. People would come to, like, there would be a circle. People would come, and they couldn't even, knew people who didn't know who he was. They didn't even know which one was the Prophet, peace upon him. That's how he was. He was just, like, with the people. He was easygoing, right? Questions? Well, I take a water break here. Thank you. Okay, have a seat. Any questions at all? Comments? No one? This is making sense to you? Go, please. Yes. As opposed to reading the Quran and yep. and seeing how that applies to the community. Okay, so from what I'm hearing from you is you feel the community has focused on picking up details from the Sunnah? Well, not the Sunnah, the Hadith. The Hadith, oh, perfect. Okay, I'm yeah. with you. Okay. So let's say it's, it's saying all the Sunnahs, but there's a Hadith that's different. Okay. And so this is, I feel that this is not the correct which one? The hadith or the collection of the hadith? They, hadith, they say taking sunnah upon hadith oh, and using it over the Quran. Okay. So I'm not going to get into a conversation about hadith versus Quran and all that kind of stuff. We're not going into that. But we're, we're talking to a larger point here. Okay. The larger point is this let's pretend we were like a fly on the wall in a gathering of the companions right now. Do you think they were arguing about like minutia? Like the Quran tells you not to argue about it. There's revelations that don't argue about the minutia. Or were they like taking in the beauty of the Prophet peace be upon him and the beauty of how to like, like I'll give you an example. Okay, since, since there's a little tangent here. We we're talking about the greatness of Sayyidina Abu Bakr. Right? And I think all the companions are great, but he's my favorite. And for all of you here listening, when you start studying the Sirah, pick the one that resonates. They're all life coaches. The Prophet peace be upon him said they're all like the stars. Just follow one, you'll be rightly guided. I get intimidated by Sayyidina Umar. He's just not like me. I just tend to be kind of mellow and chill. I think Sayyidina Abu Bakr was like that too. I like him. He's my guy. He's my life coach. In the Masjid at Fajr, how many of you know the story? I'm getting on a tangent, but I think it's important to at least understand my approach. So I call my approach to Islam, to, to the Sirah, ABCs. Why is it called the ABCs? Because it's simple, it's easy. Let's not make this complicated, okay? Allah sent this to all of humanity. He didn't send it to like physicists only. It's the ABCs. 
But ABC is also stands for Abu Bakr Coaching. So that's why I call it the ABC plans, the Abu Bakr Coaching Plan. That's what I call it, okay? Let's take an example from my coach. You can pick your own coach. The Prophet, uh, at, at the time of uh, Sayyidina Abu Bakr, when he was the Khalifa, he would lead the Salah at Fajr. Sayyidina Umar would watch, and everyone else would be there doing their adhkar and all that kind of stuff. And he'd notice Abu Bakr would always just like, kind of like, just do his Salah and just like leave. How many of you know the story? He would just do like the kind of what he needed to do and he'd just get move on with his day. While everyone else is kind of like maybe rocking back and forth, reciting, memorizing, all this kind of stuff in the afterglow of Fajr. And he's like, what's going on? I don't know, I don't know what's going on here. Like, where is he going? What is he doing? He's like the, he's like the Amir al-Mu'minin. And so he goes and he starts following him. And then he sees that he goes far off outside of Medina to like someone's house. And he goes inside for a while. And then after some time, an hour or two, he comes back and he starts his day in Medina. And he's like, what? Like all the best companions are sitting in the masjid. What is he doing? Any of you know this story? Yeah. And then he watches it again. And then he's like, what's going on here? And then he goes into the house, knocks on the door. One day when Sayyidina Abu Bakr is not there, what's going on? He finds out the house belongs to an elderly blind lady who's taking care of some orphans who are not even her own. And because she's blind, she can't really take care of them, prepare the food and this and that. Say, no, Bakr, just do the salah, get out and go start helping people. And so she said, what's going on? He says, oh, this man comes and helps me. He's like, do you know who it is? And she's like, no. He's like, that's Amir al-Mu'minin. That's his Islam. And I'm giving you the story to be like, I don't even have time to discuss why we do this. I just need to get on with my business. Right? You know the story of the, when all the companions came together, the Prophet's like, how many of you have fasted today? How many of you have been to a janazah? How many of you have been this? It's like you couldn't do, if you did one of those, you'd feel like you're a rock star. The companions, none of them did anything. They're like, dude, it's just fudger. We just got here. Say in the book, yeah, I already did the janazah. I already fed the poor. And I already... Action. Okay, so that's all I'm going to tell you about that. That's my approach to it. I'm just following uh, St. Abu Bakr's coaching plan. I don't even like to get in the conversations about this stuff. Because, like, I don't have time for that nonsense. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay, let's get to this. Well, the cookie being burnt. Now you're seeing why it's going to be. We're going to get to why it's burnt in a second. So let's talk about why the cookies get burnt. Okay. The Prophet Muhammad. So we're going to get into the, the nitty gritty here. Okay. So three, we're going to talk about the sila. So I said, if we can achieve three today, I'll be happy. Four, I think we're going to need, we'll have two more sessions, inshallah, to get into this stuff. Okay, everyone take a deep breath. I want your brains to be full of oxygen here because we're going to like really get into the, the meat of this conversation now about the sirah. Because I promise you, I'll teach you the sirah, right? So this is what I love teaching. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, lived for 63 years. I want to draw his life like this. He was born here at zero. He died at 63. He got his first revelation at the age of, to say it out loud, 40. 40. So 40 is probably right here. Okay? So up until this time, he's just, he's, I don't want to say just, he's Muhammad ibn Abdullah. That's what he's known as, right? He's just, he's Muhammad in Mecca. And then after that period of time, he is known as the Prophet, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Okay, so for 40 years he's Muhammad, and for 23 years he's the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He lived in two cities during his lifetime. What are those two cities? Mecca and Medina. How long did he live in Mecca? We're gonna we're gonna write Mecca in blue here. Mecca, he lived for all of these 40 years. Okay, and he lived for about 12 more years here, okay? So this is Mecca. We'll just say Mecca MC. And then he lived in Medina for the last 11 years of his life, which we'll say is MD, okay? So 11 years here, 12 years here, and 40 years right here. Do you guys see that? Is that making sense to you? We're keeping this very simple. Yes? Everyone knows these times, right? This is, where did he get his first revelation? Yeah, and where? 
The cave of Hera. Hera. So let's just write Hera right here. And when he went from Mecca to Medina, what is that called? The Hijra. They almost sound the same, Hira and Hijra. It's just one letter difference, okay? So what is so special? We're going to be focusing on this period of time right here, which is 23 years. Do you see that? 12 plus 11 equals what? 23 years. Why are these 23 years so important? The years of the prophet. The years of who said that? The years of Revelation. So the Revelation lasted 23 years. Okay? Revelation. That's why my book is called Revelation. Revelation. 23 years. We want to talk about the 23 years of the Quran being revealed. Those were the, like, all the years are amazing, but let's like really jump into it. So what I decided to do in 2010, I was halfway through writing my book, and I was overwhelmed with details of the seerah. Okay? So like I said, I was like, I put, the, I put the Quran down, I started reading the Sira. So I started with Martin Ling's book, for those of you who are familiar with this amazing book, beautiful book. I started read Martin Ling's book and started taking notes like a, like a typical medical student, highlighting and outlining. And then I started drawing maps because like, wait, I'm trying to understand stuff. And then I started drawing family trees and it was very confusing. That book has 17 people named Abdullah in it. Can you believe that? And there's one character in that book whose name is Abdullah Ibn Abdullah, okay? That's how confusing it is, right? How many of you get confused who have tried to read the Sira and get lost in the names? Raise your hand. Okay, for those of you who haven't, you haven't read the Sira then because it's all confusing, right? There's so many people. I remember there was Abu Sufyan and there's Abu Sufyan and only later on I realized, wait, there are two Abu Sufyans. I was like, what? And they're both enemies to the Prophet. It was like too confusing. So I started making notes. I started creating a glossary and I was like, I can't believe no one's done this in English. No one has a glossary. No one's made maps. There's so much on Jesus peace be upon him, that's all like made up. No one's done this in English for the prophet. So then I was like, all right, let me make a study guide for Martin Ling's book. But then after I read Martin Ling's book, I was like, maybe there's other stuff. I started reading Karen Armstrong. So I started reading all these different sirahs. And then like before I knew it, I was like, I have this thing, it's like a textbook now. Maybe I should just publish this thing. So it's not like I wanted to write this. It was just something that kind of grew out of my, only, my own desire to be like, I want something that I can hold and read and understand. So in 2010, about seven years into this journey, I was like lost in all of these details, like 600 factoids, 400 people, 17 Abdullahs. And I was like, I need to stop and come up with some kind of mnemonic to help me memorize the Sira in a way that I'll never forget ever again. That's what I'm going to give you. So I'm going to give you like the, like the 15 years I wrote this book. I'm trying to give you like the little espresso shot of everything I came up with right now. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a circle. This is a circular timeline of the Sira. Does that make sense? Yes? So if this is a circular timeline, I'm going to start writing numbers down. So this would be right here. Year one is right here. Okay? Yeah. And if this is year one, and I'm going to make this a 24-year timeline. Does that make sense? So this is year one. 24 will be right here. 12 will be down here. 13 will be here. Six will be here, seven is here, 18 is here, 19 is here. Does that make sense or am I moving too fast? It makes sense, right? Okay. So the first rule that you need to know is the rule of the four H's. Okay. You just write an H right here at the top. You write an H down here. You write an H up here above the line right here. And you write an H right here above the line right there. Okay. This is the first rule. What do you think the first H stands for? The thing that kicks off the period of Quranic revelation. What mnemonics? So I use mnemonics a lot. You know, do you guys, does everyone know what a mnemonic is? A mnemonic is like a memory aid. Okay, so you understand, I'm a, I was a medical student. Like I was so used to memorizing, I had to be like, I need to memorize it, right? So like if, um, if there's a guy uh, named Baldwin, who happens to be bald, I'll be like, oh, bald, Baldwin, his name's Baldwin. That's a mnemonic. Do you understand what I'm saying? Brothers, and I'm saying that because it's easy for me to say that, right? So that's a mnemonic, right? It's something that helps you memor remember the thing they're trying to remember. So I love mnemonics because you mem master things. So what's a mnemonic? What started in year one? What do we write up here, guys? Hira. So I'm going to write Hira here. Okay. 
what was the th- what was the migration called? Hijra. All right, we're cooking now. Guess what? This period right here. Remember we said blue is Mecca. That is the Meccan period. And this period right here, this half, is the Medinan period. So the Prophet spent roughly half of his prophetic career in Mecca, 12 years, and roughly half of his career in Medina, a little less than 12 years. Guess what? You know more than like 60% of Muslims already about the Sira. Just that little factoid. Okay, we're going to get you to 99, inshallah. 99%. Now, the two more H's. See, when the Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him, got his revelation, he originally kept it a, a secret. He didn't tell anyone about it except for his closest friends and allies. Okay, have a seat. He, didn't, he just told his closest friends. He didn't share it with anyone because it's too crazy of a message to bring to Mecca, right? Imagine if I went to Las Vegas and someone said, hey, uh, I was charged with bringing down the gambling industry in Las Vegas. Like imagine, right? That would be like an explosive idea to like try to like fight gambling in Las Vegas. Well, Mecca in many ways at that time, unfortunately, had become like Las Vegas. It was like a tourist attraction. People were coming for the idols and for the trading and the, the, the pilgrimage, like people go to Vegas for the gambling. There's no reason to be, for Vegas to exist. It's the middle of the desert. It's the gambling. Yet it has the highest concentration of hotels in any place in the, in the country or maybe the world. So you can't take down the industry that's supporting the whole town. So the prophet can't come and be like, hey, you know, the idols, I don't know about it, because he'll get, he'll get thrown out of town. So he's being very private with this message. He's being very private. He's telling Sayyidina Khadija, his daughters, his close friends, Sayyidina Ali, all the people who are close to him. Then finally he goes public with the message. And when he goes public with the message, immediately the Quraysh are like, no. Your, what do they call him? Yeah, you're crazy. Majnoon, who the hell are you? Who do you think you are? Allah would have sent an angel. Like, you're, you're nobody. Like, what, what makes you so special, right? The heat starts coming right away. It gets so hot and heavy. And this is when we have the stories of uh, Sayyidina Bilal and Ammar and Yasser and Sumayya and all, the, all the, the martyrs who died, who were persecuted because of the Muslims. That the Prophet, peace upon him, one day makes dua to Allah. And he says, you know what? We're really struggling. We are a small minority and we're being persecuted now that I've gone public with the message. Ya Allah, please give me a strong man. Like someone strong from the opposite side to like make our team big. Do you understand what I'm saying? I need like a really powerful like center who can just handle the ball and not get pushed around. And so he asks, makes Allah for dua for either one of two people. Do you know who those people were? Sayyidina Umar or Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl was actually his uncle through marriage. So the Prophet says, I want Abu Jahl or I want Umar on my team. And not to go too deep in the story, eventually Sayyidina Umar becomes the one to convert to Islam. When does Sayyidina Umar convert? And what does Allah give? Allah not only gives him Sayyidina Umar, but in the same year that he gives him Sayyidina Umar, he also gives him one other strong person, Hamza. So when does it happen? It happens in the sixth year. Hamza and Umar come to Islam. Okay? When Hamza and Umar come to Islam, the Meccans are like, whoa, wait a second. You just took our best guys. They feel threatened. Imagine if two guys, you're playing basketball and you're like the, the weak team, and then the two best guys, the biggest guys on the other team, take off their jerseys and put on your jersey. And be like, we with him now, right? The Mecca's like, whoa, we can't just foul these guys in the court anymore. These guys will like mow us down. Right? Remember how Hamza converted? He's like, he's my nephew. You want to mess with him? Mess with me. So this period of where they were persecuting low, like the servant class, like Bilal and stuff, they can't do that anymore when Hamza and Omar convert. And so because they can't persecute individuals, they start, they decide to just kick out the Prophet's family out of Mecca. They kick out the clan of Hashim and Muttalib out of Mecca. They said, you're out. 
done. You can't marry with us, you can't trade with us, you can't have food, you can't have water, you can't have anything. The companion said it was the most difficult time of the entire 23 years was those ban years where they're banned out. It got so bad that finally the Prophet was like, they're going to kill us. They're going to kill me, they're going to kill us. We need to get out of here. And so what does he do in year 13? He makes the Hijrah. He goes from Mecca to Medina. Now, when he goes to Medina, do the Muslims, do the Meccans leave him alone? What do they do? They what? They chase him. They fight with him. They attack him and they attack the Muslims. Do you guys know some of those attacks, the names of those attacks? Badr, Uhud, Battle of the Trench. It's horrible, right? It's like very difficult. There are many times where the Muslims actually think they're going to lose Medina. They think they're going to be squashed. So what Hazab talks about, it says, you were sitting at the trench, you were looking at the enemy, your hearts are in your throats, you were starting to have weird thoughts about Allah, about the companions. Like, you were like, yeah, Allah, like, did you, like, did you mess with us? Was this all a game? They're having weird thoughts about Allah. That's what Allah says in Surah Hazab. Finally, they can't, the, the Meccans, they can't, they can't um, squash the Muslims. And so they go back to Mecca. And everyone's tired of fighting. And so they said, we just need to like stop the fighting. So what do they agree to? They agree to the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. The Treaty of Hudaybiyah happens right here. And after the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, they don't attack the Muslims anymore because the treaty doesn't allow them to. In fact, they break the treaty, the Meccans. And when they break the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, the Prophet and the Muslims are free to do what? They don't, yeah, they don't have to, they don't have to like have a peace treaty now. They broke the treaty. That means Mecca is ours. We can just march on Mecca. And so they march on Mecca. And they take Mecca peacefully. Not, not uh, you know, nothing, no violence. They just take the city peacefully. And the Prophet forgives everyone, right? And everyone comes rushing to him, and they live happily ever after. Does that make sense? Let's review here. Years one through six, we're going to call early what? The early what period? Meccan period. We're going to call years six through 12 the late Meccan period. We're going to call, what are we going to call 12, 13 to 18, guys? Help me out. What are we calling this? Early Medina. And what are we calling the last one? Late Medina. Okay, how are we doing on time? Okay, we have like 10 minutes. Is everyone with me so far? Am I moving too fast for anybody? Okay. Let's talk about process. I just gave you the sira in a way that I'm telling you, trust me, 80% of Muslims don't understand the sira this way. What you know right now, walking out the door right now, 80% of Muslims don't understand. They just don't. No, they just thought Allah gave the Prophet, alayhi salam, he was this amazing person, and age 40, the Quran descended in this amazing book. It was beautifully bound. In fact, it had a ribbon in it, and the Prophet started reading the Quran and teaching it to people, and he had flipped. And you teach. That's what people think about the, the Quran. They don't understand how the Quran is revealed. They don't understand the sirah. They don't understand the process. Let's go back to cooking now. Early Meccan period. What did we have in here, guys, when we were talking about cooking? What did I draw in this quadrant when we were talking about cooking? Step one. You take your dry goods, you put them together. You get your flour, your butter, chocolate chips. Mix. Agitate. You gotta mix it good. If you don't mix it good, you're gonna have pockets of flour. They're gonna show up and it's not gonna be good. So you take your time mixing. You cannot rush the mixing of the goods. Is that clear? You cannot rush this. You can't just like throw it all together and just do. You can't do that. You have to mix and you have to check and you have to mix and check and mix and check and agitate and check and agitate and check. Is that clear? The early Meccan period is a period where the Prophet, peace upon him, for three years is just private. Okay? I'm going to kind of, three years. 
One, two, and three. These years are all private. He's just whispering. They're just starting Qiyam. They're not praying five times a day. People are still drinking alcohol. Slowly adding ingredients. Yes? You don't throw like the egg right in with the butter without milk. Slowly process. People were drinking alcohol this whole time. Why? You can't rush this process. You don't rush Islam on people the way convert comes in. Brother, astaghfirullah, tattoos, what you, we're idiots. What, you, you don't have to follow a process, but the follow, prophet had to follow a process, a process? Do you understand what I'm saying here? Give people time to understand Islam and to soak it in. So let's put all this together. The Quran is being revealed at this time. The Meccan surahs are being revealed. Is Allah talking about inheritance law right now? Is Allah talking about hadood laws right now? Is he talking about all the stuff that we love to talk about? And what they love to talk about? Is Allah mentioning any of this stuff in early Mecca? What is Allah talking about in early Mecca? Huh? Tawheed. What else? Let's name five things. Can we name five things? Day of judgment. Fasting? No, fasting was never even mentioned in, there was no fasting going on. No one fasted, no one knew what Ramadan was, no one knew any of that business. Tawheed, a belief in the Akhirah of accountability, charity, taking care of those who are oppressed, patience, sabr. That's Islam. Remember we talked about putting the, the goods in order, right? When Hamza and Omar converted to Islam, okay, then they couldn't persecute these, the agitation stopped. And so what happened is they, the late Meccan period started where they kicked the Muslims out of Mecca, the, the Prophet, peace be upon his family, out of Mecca. Like I said, it got so, this is a period of individual persecution, a period of group persecution. Finally, the Prophet went for the Hijra. The Hijra is what? Of these three quadrants, we said this was the bowl and the mixer. This was what, guys? What do we draw here? The, the baking tray. Why do you put things in a tray? Because you're about to put it in the oven. Which quadrant was the hot quadrant? You guys remember? This is the hot quadrant. Badr, Uhud, the second Badr, trench, all the battles, the raids, all the stuff that we all like to talk about and remember in the seerah, this is when the heat was applied on the Muslims. I guarantee you, if the Prophet took the Muslims from here and put them directly into Medina, they all would have burnt up like a crisp. Do you think the, Badr, the Muslims who showed up at Badr and was like, hey, we're unarmed, they're three to one and we got to go fight them. You think someone who just entered Islam in one or two years is going to stand up for that? No. They had 13 years of being with the Prophet, 13 years of falling in love with Allah, wanting to connect. All the Meccan surahs are beautiful. All, all, you know the surahs about all the Prophets that we love and the amazing stories of Musa Islam and Isa Islam, all that stuff? When were they revealed? Meccan period or Medinan period? The stories are all here. The inspiration, the tarbiyah that Allah is giving us all here in Mecca. Because when it comes time, time to Medina, we don't have time to like fall in love with Allah. You should have fallen in love with Allah. It's time to fight now. It's time to build a community now. That's why we're talking about law. That's why we're talking about rules of engagement. We don't have time to fall in love. What were you doing for 12 years? That's why the Prophet was with you for 12 years to get you to become the soldiers he needs you to be in Medina. Yes? Now, we're going to take, we're going to stop here in just a minute. Remember I told you when I started reading the Quran, I was like, oh, Surah Fatiha, fantastic. Now let me try to read Surah Baqarah. And I was like, oh, this is so hard and heavy. And I'm like getting lost and there's like a lot going on. When was Surah Baqarah revealed? Look, Surah Fatiha is up here, right? F for Fatiha. Okay, that makes sense. It's in the beginning. It's an introductory chapter. When was Surah Baqarah revealed? 
Surah Baqarah. It's like revealed he, all here. Surah Baqarah is being revealed. When is Surah Ali Imran being revealed? Right here. Surah Ali Imran is mostly about the Battle of Uhud. Right? When is Surah Ahzab been re, being, Surah An-Nisa, An-Nisa being revealed? Three minutes. Surah An-Nisa, right here. When is Surah, when are all these heavy Medina Surahs being revealed? This is when the Meccan, the Medinian Quran is being revealed. Yet, the way the Quran is ordered, they show up first. Now, I was like, oh, that's why I stink at the Quran. I don't know, like, arithmetic, and I'm, like, jumping into algebra on the second day. Do you see what I'm saying? So the take-home point today, and we'll go into this in detail, inshallah, the take-home point today that I want to leave with you is that if you do not approach the Qur'an the way the companions did, why do you think you will get the same results that they got? I was reading Surah Baqarah, Alif Lam Mim. There is no doubt in this book. I was reading it after like seven verses of Fatiha. That's all I had. Seven verses of Fatiha into Al-Baqarah. And I'm wondering, why can't I handle Al-Baqarah? Guess what? Sayyidina Abu Bakr spent 13 years and roughly two-thirds of the Qur'an preparing himself inwardly before he was allowed to hear Alif Lam Mim. There is no doubt in this book. And at that point, after 13 years of what he went through, he's like, yeah, there ain't no doubt about that. Because I just went through 13 years of hardship, and I know he's the messenger of Allah. I have no doubt. So when he sees no doubt, he starts crying. When I see no doubt, I'm like, I'm not feeling anything. So I want to leave you today with just this, that I want to leave you with the idea, I invite you to start approaching... So this is what it looks like when you're done. And we'll go through this in detail, inshallah, where we break down the Qur'an, your timeline, okay? And you guys will, inshallah, if you come next time, we will master this, okay? I want you, I want to invite you to start having a conversation in this community. And I want to be a part of this community where we start approaching the Qur'an systematically, slowly, not getting overwhelmed, not diving too much into the details. Just like take it easy. And like I say, be with the Prophet peace be upon him, and let the Qur'an come to you. Don't go to the Qur'an. Be with the Prophet, let the Qur'an come to you. Spend 12 years. I feel like we should, for our kids, like for my son, he doesn't get to like read Surah Ali Imran. Why should I have him read Surah Ali Imran? Maybe when he's 20, he can read it. For his childhood, tarbiyah, right? That's what we say. For our children, tarbiyah is the most important thing. Well, what was Allah doing with the Prophet? The, the, the companion said the Prophet was like a father to us. He was the father figure to these companions, and for 12 years, he's doing tarbiyah. He, the warriors come up here. There's no warriors over here. It's patience, perseverance, loving the messenger of Allah, so that when the time comes to fight, no one's backing down. Process is key. Go ahead. Uh, I'm not in detail. That's very important because that's the end of the process. And I'm a process person. Yes. So the end of the process is probably most important. Secondly, uh, do you know who raised, whom did our prophet raise before he got the revelation? Who he raised? Yeah, raised. Like children or like like his adopted son and stuff like that, his daughters and stuff like that? Like Anas ibn Malik, or who, who, who? He was the one that raised uh, Ali. <coughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So he raised him. Yes. He was the person that raised him. And Ali ibn Malik was the first person that accepted the revelation. Absolutely. Yeah. I just want to. No, there's no question about it. But when you look at when you look at the giants of our tradition, the giants are the people who were there from the beginning. Sayyidina Ali, right? His family, Sayyidina Fatima, right? The daughters of the Prophet. Sayyidina Abu Bakr, Talha, the warrior, right? Like, you know the Ashara Mubashari in Fil Jannah, we talk about the 10 promised paradise, right? When did they all convert? How many are Ansar? How many are Muhajirin? 
How many were Medinans? How many were Meccans? Six and four? No, they were all Meccans. And the last person to get on that ship before it left, that was to actually Sayyidina Umar. The last convert. was Sayyidina. That's telling you, you, you get in on the ground floor. That's how you have the transformation happen. Any other questions? We'll, we'll, okay, we'll stop here. Inshallah, if you have questions, we can talk afterwards. Thank you for your complete attention, Inshallah, and we'll see, I'll see you next time, Inshallah. <coughs> <laughs>